say anything that comes through now, that comes through afterwards. Good morning, my friends. Good morning. It's lovely to see you. Welcome to St. Paul's Haringey. It's really good to have you with us for church this morning. My name is Pete. I'm the pastor here. Today is going to be great. I've really been looking forward to this. This is uh, a joint service, so bringing together our normal 9.30 and 11 o'clock services. We've also got lots of time with the kids in today, both at the start and the end. And it is a world-focused Sunday, so we're going to set our sights globally this morning and we're going to try and lift our eyes up to what God is doing in the world. We've got some treats as well because um, we've got a guest preacher, Ed Michelson. Very grateful to have you here, Ed. We've got um, some great musical feasts lined up in various genres, and we're going to hear from God's Word and have communion. So there's all sorts coming up for you today. As I said, we're we're lifting our eyes to the world, and there is a lot of need in the world today, isn't there? The world needs peace. The world needs equality. The world needs lots of education and climate change in the right direction. And we're not denying any of that. We know all that's true, but actually the, the God's focus is on Jesus. So he says in the Bible, the world needs to know about Jesus Christ, his son. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And um, that's the primary way God has promised to bless the world. Please would you stand if you're able to. Hopefully you have a piece of paper that was given you on the way in, tucked inside your Bible. And you'll see it says they're gathering and call to worship. Please join in with the bits in bold. We meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. I will extol the Lord with all my heart. Alleluia, my soul. Alleluia. Let's pray. Father God, we pray. um, However we may be feeling, Father, would you lift up our hearts and would you make that alleluia real for us? I pray as we lift our sights to what you are doing, the God of all the world, would you please give us a vision for it, give us understanding, expand our hearts as well as our minds, we pray. Pray today we would listen to your word, listen to the testimony of what's going on around the world and have words to say to others to encourage them in a world full of need. We, the world needs Jesus, Father, and we long that they would know him. And we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hallelujah. Please do stay standing if you can, and um, we will have a time of open prayer. Now, maybe um, praying is not your thing. That's all right. Feel free to stay quiet. But if it is, if the Lord has laid on your heart a great song of praise, maybe a Bible verse, maybe something from that song, maybe something you've been enjoying about him recently, then feel free to pipe up and we'll, um, we'll have some prayers together. And then I'll draw it together as we close. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that Christ has defeated every sin. Um, thank you that we can cast all our burdens on you, Lord. Please help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And Lord God Almighty, I thank you for that picture of all the redeemed washed by his blood. Thank you that we're heading for a great, a great church gathering in eternity with all people from all continents and backgrounds, tribes and tongues. Thank you that we'll have one thing in common, Jesus Christ our Lord. And there'll be a great joy and an alleluia there. Lord, this is, a, this is a, just a foretaste and, and we can't wait to see the, the whole earth united under the banner of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please do take a seat, everybody. <clears throat> We're going to have a kid slot in a moment. Um, it's lovely to have so many kids in church. After that, I've just got one, one thing I'd love to, your forbearance with. I would love to take a photo of you all. Hear me out. Um, I, it's, it's rare that I get the whole church together in one place. We do have joint services, but rarely, you know, it's sometimes a Christmas day or something when plenty of people are away. So today, February, it's actually the best Sunday I've realized. And we lasted it three years ago when I got to take a photo of you all. So if you are willing, and you don't have to be willing, then um, after the kids start, I'm just going to stand up there. I'll take a photo of, of you. If you don't want to be in the photo, feel free to sort of duck, you know, turn your face away, or you can step out of the room in a, in a minute or two if you like to. I totally understand. Um, or you can just let me know afterwards and I can blur your face on anything we use it on. But it is great to have a photo of the whole church. It's great to use it on a, on a website or a post from time to time. So that's what I would use it for. And if you're willing to have your face seen and you don't let me know, I'll sort of take that as your consent, all right, for this photo. Thank you. It's a lovely, rare opportunity today. Right, Katie, over to you. I'm the Children Youth Worker here, um, and I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what we are going to be learning about in Junior Church this morning. But first, I thought I would start by telling you a joke, because uh, I love a good joke. Um, here's my best joke. Who is the shortest person in the Bible? You ready? Nehemiah. 
Thank you. I thought it deserved more, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> we're learning about Nehemiah this morning. And um, as you might be able to tell, I'm ready to do some building. Um, today, as we're thinking about Nehemiah, we're thinking about building the church. So I've got my high vis on, health and safety, Courtney, I'm ready. Um, and I'm going I'm to do some building. We're building the church. Okay, hang on, give me a minute. Nehemiah told me to do. I built the church really well. And um, yeah, we'll go and do some building in Junior Church. Or maybe that's not what Nehemiah was telling me to do. Um, do I need to become a master builder to learn how to follow a God like how Nehemiah says? Nehemiah worked really hard and he built up some walls. But that's not what God's telling us to do. God is telling us to build his church. And that doesn't mean building the bricks and the mortar and making a building. Um, it means something much, much cooler than that and much more exciting. Um, and we're going to be having a think about that as we head down to our groups this morning. What does it mean to build the church and how can we do it like Nehemiah did? I'm going to pray and then we're going to head out. If you're not, no, we're going to stay here and Pete's going to take a lovely photo. Um, <laughs> if you're not to two, there's crash next door in the church house. If you're 2 to 11, come downstairs and we will um, have a great time. Uh, I'm going to pray and then Pete will take a photo. Father God, thank you so much uh, for your word. Thank you for how it teaches us and instructs us. Um, please, would you help us to be like Nehemiah? Um, would you help us to build your church? Please, would you help us this morning to understand what that means, to um, learn from your word and grow as we listen to you? In Jesus' name, amen. Katie, thank you. Right, you ready, everybody? Um, you can stay sitting down, but if you would be willing to give me a wave, a wave is very friendly, okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna get all the height I can. Here we go. Can you wave and say, hello? Very good. Hello. One more time, say hello. That's perfect. You are. You look lovely. I've never been this high up before. This is fantastic. Okay. Um, under 11s, you're, you're free to go and your leaders. Thank you so much. Um, everyone else, just take a, take a minute if you like. In Blow my face. Hey. Blow your face. Okay. If you don't want to. Good morning, everyone. I am Brian. And I am Sarah. Um, I think most of you know us anyway. But we are here to talk about the mission support group, uh, the MSG. So uh, we are a group that seeks to facilitate mission support work uh, here at St. Paul's. And there are mainly three things we encourage all of us to do, which is to pray, to give, and to go and we meet twice a year. So, um, as Sarah, what, what, what do we do on sort of uh, practical terms? So. Um, well, we, like Brian said, we meet twice a year and we seek to support the missionaries that we 
um, support here at St Paul's. So we, they, they kind of fit into three categories. We, we support um, local missions, so that's anything basically in, in the UK or around here, um, and then international missions, so worldwide, and then anything that's to do with training uh, people to do mission. So we try and um, we work out um, how those missionaries fit in and how we can support them best. We pray for them and we allocate money to them. Um, one of those, um, one of those is uh, the trip that fits into the training category is um, summer camp bursaries. Brian, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, great question. <laughs> so. Um, I'm a fan of summer camps. I've done it for several years now, and uh, I think when I first went, I didn't really know what to expect, but actually it's uh, basically so going to a summer camp where young people can come and have loads of activities, make friendships, but more importantly, to learn from the Bible. So they'll hear talk talks in the morning and uh, in the evening as well. And uh, I just find it's actually a wonderful way to learn how to serve and minister uh, to other people, so the Bible would say we are to speak the truth in love to uh, one another and to serve one another, to teach young people. So um, actually it's just it's like really fun, but also it's like an intensive training while you're having fun. Uh, so that, there's so many benefits that come with it. And uh, I think every summer I've done it and uh, every time I just learn something new. And we think it's great for, um, for kind of training us as well so if any anyone's interested but struggles to afford it uh, we have set aside some money so a bursary so that those who would like to lead could could uh, uh, get support but also for young people here in our church as well if they struggle to get enough money to go on it we'd love to try to support them as well so do speak to us and uh, yeah, since you asked a great question let me ask one back um, <laughs> Tell us, uh, Sarah, about the biblical counsel, counseling training that we have support, supported. Um, yeah, well, I'd love to. Um, Ava and me have both been supported by the church to do some biblical counseling um, training. And it is a part-time course um, that you can do from home or, um, and also partly at Oak Hill College. Um, that assists you to counsel people through life, whatever's going on, the good, the bad, the ugly, in a scriptural way, helps you to do it um, more effectively. And it is the best course. It is, I might even say it's life transforming. It was an amazing course to do. Um, I did it over about five years, but you can do it um, you can do it module by module and see how you go. It's, um, it's a part-time course that takes approximately 10 hours a week. Now, we would love to support in our church people, um, others, to do that course as well. If that interests you, please do come and talk to us. Um, we'd love to talk to you about it. We've set aside money to train people to do it. Um, it is um, it's intense and it's time-consuming. And I always... I spent a few years thinking, now's not a good time, it's not a good time to start. But can I just encourage you, I was saying this to somebody earlier this week um, who's thinking about it, um, there's never a good time to do it. And actually, the course itself affects what you're doing in life, work, parenting, whatever. Um, so if you think, oh, actually, I just don't think I've got the time, you might find, if you make the time, that it actually helps you through whatever you're doing at the moment so there isn't a good time to squeeze in an extra 10 hours a day uh, a week to do it but it's um it's worth thinking about it and seeing what the lord does with it and how he can use it in your life and others um brian does the mission support group need any more members yeah let me think about that hmm. what a great question yeah, we do. Uh, we need one other person. And uh, as mentioned, the commitment is two meetings a year. And uh, your role would involve kind of discussing with the rest of the group um, where we allocate money to or uh, suggest new ideas, really. We uh, need more ideas. 
And so if you're interested, please come and talk to us, speak to one of us, uh, or Marilyn or Pete. And uh, if you just want to know more about the group as well, uh, feel free to chat to us as well. Great. We come now to a time of prayer. Let me lead us. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my shorty stands, before the throne my shorty stands, my name is written on his hands. Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers, they strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh forgive, they cry. Forgive him, oh forgive, they cry. Nor let that ransomed sinner die. <coughs> Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for our atoning sacrifice, our Lord Jesus, who bled for us, as you say in First John, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, that sacrifice is where love and justice meet. It is so rare to see both things in, in our world come together. But Lord, you are loving, but yet you are just. And you're angry with sin in the world and with uh, sinners uh, like us. And thank you that that justice is meted out on Jesus Christ. So we don't have to bear it. We think of that bloody sacrifice the violent ending of our Lord's life, the love that led him to do that and led him to freely give his life to us. And we pray and our, on our World Missions Day today, we would uh, have a deeper understanding of that and that's what the world ourselves need desperately. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. You, Lord, are the righteous judge of the world. Nothing is hidden in your sight. We pray that you would hold evildoers to account, those who kill the innocent and yet are unpunished, those who wage war for unjust gain and to spread hatred. Abraham cried to you, will not the judge of the world do right? And so we pray justice would prevail and that peace would be found in areas like Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, and other war zones absent from our daily thoughts. In your justice, may those who are unrepentant appear before you and be found guilty, but may those who turn to you in true repentance be saved and be protected by you, and may they be peacemakers. We pray also for Jennifer, our sister, who lost her son recently. We pray that the perpetrators of murder would be caught and put to justice. Please <coughs> aid the efforts of the police to do so. Meanwhile, we pray that you would hold her fast and she would persevere by your strength. I made a funeral. Well, on the occasion of grief, be one that also points many people to you, the hope of all the world. In Jesus' name, amen. On World Focus Sunday today, we pray, Heavenly Father, that all of our mission partners across the world would continue to hold out that gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, crucified for sins, bore your righteous wrath, but rose to glorious life after three days and taken up in glory. Through our mission partners, may many turn to him in faith and repentance and take refuge in you and the judgment that is to come. We pray for 500K and Ed and his team that you would bless their great attempt 
to plant 500,000 churches in India. We pray that they would continue, continue partnering with and nourishing the local churches there. May their partnership be so characterized by gospel humility that it would give glory to you and cause onlookers to see that Jesus is among them. And when persecution arises, may they endure the cross, despise the shame, and triumph by the blood of the Lamb. We pray also for our own hearts here, ourselves here at St. Paul's, that we wouldn't be unmoved by the pressing need of the nations to hear your saving message. May we sit humbly under your most holy word and obey your commands to make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' name, amen. For Hope Explored that finished last Thursday, we pray, Heavenly Father, that those who attended would, would clearly see that you are only, our only hope for sins forgiven. And sin is the very reason for our separation from you and for all the conflicts in the world and in our families. We pray that St. Paul's would be a welcoming, a welcoming place for them. And finally, for those who are unwell, we pray, Heavenly Father, that they would hold on to your promise that you are with those who are contrite and lowly in spirit. We pray this for Beryl Crawford, Carmel Burrow, Veronica Caldera, Siva Clements, Wilma Best, Loretta Medici, Jasmine Hodge, Lena Roach, Helen Taylor, and our neighbor Sharon. For we ask all these things by the merits of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray the church family prayer together, printed on your sheets. <clears throat> so we pray. God our Father, in your abundant grace, you have called us out of darkness and made us a family on mission, treasuring Christ. Raise our love for Jesus, broaden our love for neighbor, deepen our growth as disciples, and expand your kingdom by planting churches not for our own name, but in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Brian. As I said, our preacher today is Ed Michelson, who leads an organization called 500K. So Ed, you're very welcome. Ed came to visit a prayer meeting here last year. You may have been at that one. and. I basically gave him five minutes to speak at that prayer meeting and uh, that was far too short and I thought this guy's got exciting things to say about what God is doing in India so we've got him back here and given him a full sermon so I'm really looking forward to the word you're going to bring to us Ed thanks for being here today first of all though Virginia is going to bring us our Bible reading Um, the reading is taken from Mark chapter 5 and starting at verse 21. It's on page 1007 in the um, Church Bibles. So. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying, please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. 
He turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see, the, the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter's dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, friends. It is a delight to be with you here today on World Mission Sunday. World Mission is the cause about which I am the most passionate. It is the cause to which I have dedicated my life, and it is a pleasure to get to share with you about that this morning. I work a couple of days a week as an a and &E doctor in a hospital in South East London, in Woolwich, in the emergency room there. I say this to you as a warning note. So if any of you find yourself in the Woolwich area and start to feel a little bit sick, just try and make it to Lewisham. And there's no chance you'll have me as your doctor. This work which I do there a couple of days a week, this is my tent making profession. So I can do what I'm really passionate about, that is gospel work free of charge. 500K, we are a mission organization and a charity which reaches unreached villages in India for the gospel. And we do this by sending indigenous local Indian people as local missionaries to share the gospel there. And our passion is to give people and churches here in the UK the opportunity to reach the unreached without leaving our homes, without saying goodbye to our families, without quitting our jobs, by partnering with and sending, that looks like praying and giving for these local people, we can reach unreached villages for the gospel without saying goodbye to what we're doing here in the UK. Our passion is that there is no treasure that compares to knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. There are all kinds of blessings in this world, all kinds of good things. Education, wealth, status, who you know, what you've accomplished, but really all of these things are insignificant. They're irrelevant compared to one detail. Are you one of the lucky people in this world who has had the opportunity of knowing Jesus? Everything else is essentially irrelevant compared to that one opportunity, that one privilege. Have you had the chance to know Christ and receive eternal life in him? Why do we believe this? Why are we so passionate about this? Well, let's find out. The context in Mark 5 is one of crisis. 
Jesus has just had Jairus come up to him and tell him, Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Would you help her? Jesus is walking with Jairus, but he gets interrupted. Starting reading from verse 24, it says, So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed around and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. This woman was a person whom Jesus interacted with 2,000 years ago. But even more than that, I believe this woman is a symbol for every person on this planet. This person, this woman, she was afflicted with problems too big for her to solve. Bleeding that could not be healed. Daily pain, shame and stigmatization shut out from the temple, being told that she was unclean and contaminated. Her life was one of pain and suffering. But so is the life of every person on this world. People knowing such fears, such sorrows, such anxieties. We like to think these problems are disappearing, but they're not. Research has shown Generation Z, that's people going to university, graduating from university now, have higher levels of anxiety and depression than ever before. The leading cause of death for people in the USA now, under the age of 40, is addiction to opioids, to drugs. People are in pain, people are hurting, people are doing whatever they can to solve those problems. They're not finding the solution. I've had patients say to me, request not to be discharged from hospital because they say, when I leave here, I'm gonna be all alone. Yet this woman, she sees Jesus. She knows that Jesus is her hope. She reaches out and touches him. She finds salvation. That is my testimony. I know that it is a testimony of every person here who has encountered the Lord, whether it was immediate for this woman or whether it has been gradually over months and years, all of us have encountered Jesus. We have reached out, taken hold of him, and he has met us in our pain. He has ministered to us in our pain. Let's read on. Verse 30. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Again, our reactions when we encounter the God of this universe are the same as this woman. It's a reaction of fear. A reaction of, am I going to be judged? Am I going to be condemned? This woman falls on her face, trembling with fear. This is our natural reaction when we think of God, when we encounter with God. We are terrified. All of us, like this woman, feel and know that we are not good enough. 
People spend their whole lives trying to overcome this problem. Endlessly trying to progress in their careers. Endlessly trying to store up more wealth. Endlessly trying to please people. Everything to overcome this sense of, I'm not good enough. I'm inadequate. Yet this woman, in the presence of Jesus Christ, in the presence of the Lord Almighty, trembling with fear, we see the reaction of our God. Jesus does not respond with anger or judgment, but Jesus reaches out with love and says, daughter, your faith has healed you. That is the power of faith. Though we are not good enough, though we are inadequate, through Jesus, we are saved by faith. And we know and encounter the love of God. But the story doesn't end there. Verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. So what we might say, Jesus can meet us today and minister to us in our pain. But what of the ultimate problem? What of the ultimate enemy? What of death itself? What of bereavement? What of the pain I have from people I've lost? What of the fear I have from when I will have to face death myself? This is something too great, even for Jesus. Or so the friends of Jairus thought. Jairus, you're too late. What terrible Hopeless words. Jairus, you tried. You wanted to save your daughter, but I'm sorry. It's too late. She's gone. Even Jesus can't help her now. But into that crisis, into that emergency, Jesus looks at Jairus and he says, Don't be afraid. Just believe. Thanks to Jesus, we need no longer, no fear. Then Jesus takes his three closest disciples. He takes Jairus with him. He goes into that room. He goes to that little girl and he says, why are you laughing, weeping? The little girl is not dead, but asleep. And then he raises her to life again. That was true for that man and that family. That is true now for every family that trusts in the Lord. Even death itself has been relegated to mere sleep, a mere temporary separation. This is the power of the gospel. This is the great treasure of the Lord Jesus Christ and this is why I believe seeing all of this world reached with his message must be one of our first priorities. Jesus' last commandment to his disciples was go unto all nations and share this message. Make disciples, baptizing people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So glorious is this opportunity of following Jesus. We need to make Jesus' last command one of our first priorities. That's something I've tried to do with my life. And I'd like to share with you just a bit of the story of that. When I was growing up, one of my overwhelming experiences, or perhaps the overwhelming experience growing up, was one of boredom. School was boring. Being at home was boring. But every night, me, my brother, my sisters, we would come together and my parents would read to us missionary stories. 
Stories of men and women who risked everything, left everything behind. Hudson Taylor, he traveled for five months to go to the other side of the world. They were adventure stories. That really happened. Hudson Taylor, he's in China. He faces unimaginable difficulties, persecution, opposition. He's beaten up. He faces personal tragedy. I remember hearing his story and thinking, wow, this is someone who has found something worth dying for. And you, I remember reading his diary, excerpts from his diary, the encounters he had with the Lord, the joy and the peace that he knew. I realized this wasn't someone who had just found something worth dying for. He had discovered the secret of really living as well. Purposeful, passionate, meaningful lives. Growing up, I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to be a missionary. All life so far has been boring, but here are lives of purpose, meaning, and adventure that really happened. I want to follow in these footsteps. I enrolled in a medical school for that reason. It was what Hudson Taylor did. He said it would be helpful for him on the mission fields. I thought the same. Before going to university, I took a year out to get some mission experience. And I find myself traveling in India and encountering these stories of what Indian people are doing. And they sounded just like the stories I had read to me growing up. People leaving everything behind, risking their lives for Jesus, seeing great breakthroughs for the gospel. Uh, I saw this and, and thought, wow. I thought people like this didn't exist anymore. I thought they were locked away in the storybooks 100 years ago. Here I am, meeting them, interacting with them. And I had a moment when I was worshipping with a tiny little church meeting in someone's home. And I just thought, here I am, worshipping with this church. I've got nothing in common with these people. Different language, different culture, different clothes. Superficially, everything is different. But as soon as I hear these people worshipping, I know we're a part of the same family. And I thought, you know what? Until five years ago, the gospel had simply never reached this community. But now there is a church here. Now my family is here. And I just thought, what I am witnessing here, what I am seeing, this is history in the making. And I had, this was a real transformation moment for me. I had a sense of, I don't think you guys need me coming to you as a missionary. You're already doing it. How can I be a part of what is happening here? And they said, Ed, well, one of the ways that you can help is through giving. Our own churches are poor. We're struggling to look after our own pastors, the poor in our own communities. Let alone send out other people as missionaries. And I heard this and I thought, what? You mean the coolest thing I've ever heard isn't happening for money? That's crazy. It's also kind of encouraging because that's something I can really easily help with. Getting my friends interested in Jesus, that can be hard going. But I can make money. I just have to turn up at work. I don't even have to be particularly good if I'm just there. Money comes in. This is when people say, hmm, yeah, Ed, I don't know if I'd want to have you as my doctor. <laughs> and I said to them, look, how much do these guys need? They said, Ed, in your terms, we're talking about 60 pounds a month. I thought, wow, that's crazy. I could be one missionary myself, or I could be a doctor in the UK. I could still try and live simply, live basically as if I was on the front line myself and give the difference, earn a good salary, give the difference. Rather than being one missionary, I could support maybe even 20, 30, 40 of these indigenous missionaries instead. That was really the beginning. I was giving. I shared about what I was doing with some friends who were students. They wanted to give as well. Things began to, to build up speed. That's a whole other story. But four years later, we launched 500K. And we said, what would it take? We believe that Jesus is this great treasure. What would it take 
for everyone in India to have this opportunity to meet with him. What would it take? The research we had available to us at the time said that of the 600,000 villages in India, as many as half a million, 500,000, have got no church, no Christian presence, no gospel witness. So we said, well, that is the need for everyone in India to have a chance to hear about Jesus. You would need to have 500,000 churches, a church in every village, a gospel witness in every community. We launched the organization. We said, that is the vision everyone having a chance to hear this message of Jesus, a church in every village, a gospel witness in every community, 500,000 churches. Unfortunately, there's a, a sensitive political situation in India now, so we just put as the name of the organization, 500K. So offline, we can explain what we're about. Publicly, it's not obvious. 500K. We launched, this is our 10th anniversary year, we launched 10 years ago. Back then we were supporting 30 of these indigenous missionaries. Now by the grace of God, we're supporting over 1,000. These people have reached 3,500 villages. We're hoping this year, or potentially next year, we're gonna break through the 5,000 village barrier. It's gonna be the first 1% of the 500,000 villages need. What we are doing now is just scraping the surface of what is the potential. God is raising up his church. More and more people are starting Bible colleges, training people to send out to reach these villages. We're just seeing the beginnings. I'd like to share with you the story of a woman I met two years ago, 2022, when I was in India. We were traveling, uh, traveling towards a, a jungle to visit some work amongst the tribes there, and we stopped off at one of these little church plants. And this woman starts sharing with me her story. And I thought it was remarkable, because it reminded me somewhat of that woman we heard about earlier in the passage, the woman with the issue of bleeding. This woman told me how for seven years, she was so weak, she couldn't get out of bed. So every day her children were coming and washing her in the bed or putting her on the bedpan, sometimes picking her up out of the bed, putting her in the chair, putting her back in the bed. That was her life for seven years. And she's not an elderly woman. She's in her 50s now. An evangelist, this has nothing to do with 500K, an evangelist, he goes through the village. He's looking for people to pray for and to minister to. Someone tells him about this woman. He goes and meets her, shares about Jesus with her, prays with her, and this continues over a process of six months. He's ministering to this woman. And she told me how over those six months, to begin with, she started just being able to sit on the edge of the bed, then to walk around with a stick. By the end of those six months, she told me she had been completely healed. Radiant smile on her face, Her health fully returned to her. That was when I met her. But there had been, this is the interesting thing, there had been a 10-year gap between when that happened and when I met this woman. The evangelist, he's an itinerant evangelist. It's in his nature to move on to the next place. He leaves. This woman is then all by herself in this village as a believer. And I'm speaking to the missionary who was sent to that community, and I was asking him, "How how did you pick a village to go and minister to? And he said, well, my leader said to me, I want you to go somewhere in this district, somewhere in these clusters of villages, but I want you to look to the Lord to direct you. Where do you want to minister? So he's walking from village to village, and he's just praying as he goes. And he told me there was a particular village where he feels a sense of peace. He goes to that village, and uh, I wouldn't recommend what he does. He buys a microphone and a little PA system. He starts preaching the gospel on the street. There is a lot of persecution, there's a lot of resistance to the gospel in India these days, so I wouldn't recommend this, but there he is. He's preaching the gospel on the street. Who walks past? It's this very same woman who had been healed 10 years earlier. She said to him, are you preaching the gospel? He said, I am. She shares her story with him and she said, for 10 years I've been praying that God would lead someone to this village to continue what that evangelist begun. 10 years ago, and now you're here, an answer to prayer. 
She opens up her networks to him, her friends, her families. He begins sharing the gospel with them. That was the beginning of the church in her community. Began this message reflecting on the fact that there is no treasure that compares to knowing Jesus. And that consequently, one of our great priorities must be reaching the unreached. This is the challenge that I want to leave with you. Both globally, around the world, and locally, right here in London. How are you making this gospel message a priority, a focus? How are you leaning in? How are you praying? How are you saying, God, use me. I know the power of your message. I know the glory of your gospel, but I am a weak and broken person. Would you use me? Would you help me to see that which truly matters? So many of our brothers and sisters around the world are risking their very lives for the gospel. I could tell you so many stories of people who have been threatened and beaten up for sharing about Jesus in India. This is the price other people are paying. What can we be doing? What is the step of obedience that God is leading us towards? When I'm in the hospital, and I'm only there a couple of days a week, sometimes people say to me, Ed, you're only here a couple of days a week. What are you doing the rest of your time? And I say, oh, well, um, you know, I'm doing some charity work. And they go, oh, wow, charity work, that's really awesome. Tell us more. And I say, okay, it's about community development and transformation in India. And they're like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. Tell us a bit more. And, you know, the questions keep on coming. And in the end, I say, well, basically, we're helping Indian people share the gospel with other Indian people. And they say, wait, you're trying to convert people. Why don't you do something useful? And this is when I say to them, well, as doctors, we think we have this amazing opportunity to save lives. But I don't know why we say this. All of our patients still die. We like to call ourselves lifesavers. Really, we're death postponers. But Jesus Christ and his message really can save lives forever and ever and ever and bring life in all of its fullness in the here and the now. I have never had a patient receive treatment in my hospital and say to me, you know what, doctor? Thanks to your treatment today, I have received life in all of its fullness. Maybe one day they will. Somehow I doubt it. But I've had friends come to know Jesus. And they've said, Ed, it's like my whole, my whole life has been filled with color. Before, everything was black and white. Now it is vibrant. That is the power of the gospel. And would we make sharing it one of our priorities? If uh, you'd like to know more about 500K, I've got a, a sign-up sheet here. This one's in my pocket. You don't need to use this one. But there's another one at the back of the church, along with some booklets about 500K as well. What I would love to do is invite you, if you feel the Lord is leading you, to participate in this. We have the opportunity to reach unreached villages with the gospel. We have the opportunity to make history. Would we seize that? What a legacy we can have just through praying and through giving. So I want to invite you to do both of those. You can pray and you can do that just by putting your name and email address down. We have a, a WhatsApp group where we frequently share stories, like the stories I've shared today, of how God is breaking through in these communities. And I think it's so important for us to be hearing these stories, encouraging stories of how God is transforming lives. And you can also give. Just think about that. 
60 pounds a month, that's all it requires to send someone to an unreached village for the gospel. Maybe even that is beyond your means. Two people can club together, 30 pounds a month each. It can be done. So I want to invite you to participate in that. If that is where the Lord is leading you, you can pray and you can give. Well, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today on World Mission Sunday. Thank you for what you are doing as a church, both locally and globally. And please pray for us. I'll be praying for you until I see you again. Um, we're going to respond in, in song now, so if you're able to stand, please, please do, and we'll sing uh, the creed.
Let's pray, shall we, just as we stand. Oh Lord, God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we believe in you, we love you, we trust you. Thank you for what we adults have been able to hear today about how um, all over the world the gospel is bearing fruit from that one woman who reached out to touch Jesus and received salvation all the way to India. We're amazed at you and we pray we'd have a sight of more of this in our lifetime in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do sit. Welcome back to our junior church. I'm really glad you could come back. I asked if you could come back in actually this, um, this Sunday because we're going to share the Christian family meal and I want you to see what Christians do when they get together. We share communion, bread and wine. And it's special to be able to do it as an entire, entire church today. It will be a little bit noisy. I'm okay with that. Um, I'd encourage you to embrace it for the sake of the whole church being together. We're going to be using the laminate which is in your pack. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord's Supper is given that all who participate may remember Christ's death on the cross once for all to pay for sins and his glorious resurrection to reign at God's right hand as Lord and Judge. It is given that we who are in need of God's sustenance and fatherly care might feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. It is given as a memorial by Jesus himself and practiced by his apostles and earliest followers. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and the wickedness we have committed time after time by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty. We have provoked your righteous anger and your indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are deeply sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may always serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the words our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Hear what Saint Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear what St. John says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers in his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. In a moment, we'll, we'll share this bread and this wine. This is the Christian family meal that Jesus commanded us to, to take together. There's a lot of joy in it, especially today being all together as a church. It's for you if you're a Christian. So if you can say, like we were hearing in the Bible today, I've, I've reached out, I've taken hold of Jesus Christ by faith, and you're welcome at his table. If you're not yet a Christian, then it's not yet for you. And, and I pray the day will come when you're ready to take this tangible declaration of faith. And um, the normal pattern is that, kids, you are welcome to come up if you haven't yet got to age 11 and been baptised and confirmed, then this is not yet for you. But I know for some of you that the day is coming and we look forward to that day. Could I have my three helpers up today? Sarah, Brian and Ben. <laughs> Thank you. So re rejoice, do come forward. You'll be offered hand sanitizer and um, you'll be invited up. We'll start at the front and work our way back. If, it's, if this is not yet for you, feel free to stay in your seat. But if it is for you, then draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen.
Let's join together in the prayer after communion. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share in Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please would you stand if you, ca if you can and we'll sing.
please do sit. I have a little church family news for you. There is an insert in your pack somewhere. Let me take you through the main things. The funeral of Jonah Hoshu is going to be here at St. Paul's on Friday the 23rd of February, and that's going to be at 11 o'clock. We hope to provide a YouTube stream so that this building does have a limited capacity, but we hope that by that means other people will be able to join in with it. And then um, Jennifer and Camila tell me that there'll be a burial afterwards at Stewardstone Cemetery. In the meantime, we have a church lunch after the service in the church hall. Thank you so much. If you have brought food along and you're willing to share a bit of it around, then my plan is that by that means, everyone will get fed. So if you, if you could just take it down to the church hall, down the steps, into the next building, um, then put it on the table and um, I think everyone will, there'll be enough to go around. I certainly made a lot of bread. If you didn't know about it, then you do, come to lunch with us. We're going to have lunch straight after the service. Um, it's dead easy. It's just in the next building. And you're really, really welcome. It's just a simple meal together. It's special to have everyone together today. In particular, we don't actually get to do church lunches much in the winter because it's, it's much easier to barbecue outdoors in the summer. So if you can come, I'd love you to stay. Beyond that, church prayer meeting is this week uh, at, on Wednesday. Um, Courtney, do we have a daytime one on Wednesday? So 10 a.m., or 8 p.m. Both of them in here. It's a gift to be able to pray for an hour. Our mission partner, Adam Boyce, is going to be visiting. Ben, now you had something to tell us about WhatsApp. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm a ministry trainee here. A quick notice about WhatsApp. Um, many of you will be in WhatsApp groups as part of church life, you know, for serving teams, different ministries, rotors and stuff, uh, home groups, that sort of thing. Um, you might have already seen over the next week or two, we're going to move those WhatsApp groups under uh, a new umbrella, uh, the St. Paul's WhatsApp community. Ooh. Oh, thank you, yeah. So uh, what's that? It's very simple. WhatsApp communities is a kind of newish feature from WhatsApp that lets you group a bunch of related chats together, which kind of makes sense for us because we've got a bunch of chats that kind of are all under the St. Paul's umbrella. Um, hopefully this change will make your WhatsApp kind of inbox, whatever you call it, a lot more organized. It will kind of put them all together, make it a lot easier for you. Um, I think particularly making this small change will be really great for newcomers to church because it means that all the groups they could join, like socials or, or the prayer group or whatever, uh, it's all there in one place. They can discover it easily enough. So I think it'd be really good for people who are new to our church. Um, we're also going to move the, the WhatsApp broadcasts that Pete does over to the community as well because it lets you do that as well. Um, if you're not too sure about technology, don't worry. Basically, nothing's changing. It'll be a very, very small change in your WhatsApp app. I'd be surprised if you noticed it, to be honest. But we thought we should flag it. Um, and if you don't use WhatsApp at all, then that's fine, because you don't need to be using WhatsApp to be part of the church family here. Uh, but we just thought we'd let you know, if you see something slightly change in your WhatsApp app with our group chats for St. Paul's, that's what's happened. It's going to be great. Let me know afterwards if you have any questions. Thanks. I'm nearly done, but this is the most bizarre notice I've ever given. Um, does anyone know what this is? Because I cannot work it out. Um, I've been having a clear out on the balcony up there. Bethany and Terry and I have been trying to work out what is this enormous object in the church. I will, I'm not going to take answers now. However, <laughs> I, I will give you, I'll give you a, um, a chocolate prize if you can just tell me what it is. Um, or if just make up something funny that, make, that makes me laugh, I'll give you a, a prize as well. Okay, so um, you could talk about that over lunch if you like. Um, finally... Thank you to Ed. Ed mentioned his WhatsApp group for 500k. I'm in it. I recommend it. You get this little feed of encouragement. So um, by all means, put, put your name on the list before you leave the building today. Time for one more song. Let's sing The Lord's My Shepherd. Thank you. 
Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.